I'll leave this door open for like 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I'm going to close the door. By the time you finish saying it. So my name is Drew Barton. Uh, my company is Southern Web. It's a digital marketing agency in Atlanta. Um, I've done this uh, slide deck for you. It's called 30 Things to Do Before Launch. And I've done it because in our agency we support about 445 websites. And with that volume of sites going out the door, it's about two to four sites a week that go out. Um, we had to have some way to regulate the quality of the sites that are going out the door each time. So the way to do that, at least in our case, was to put together a list of things that we were going to do with every site that got launched. So I figured this is such a good thing to share it with the, uh, with the other people that are doing WordPress. So, I'm going to walk you through this. The talk is 30 minutes. There's 30 things. We're going to do one thing a minute. So we're going to go super fast. But at the very end, you'll have the slides with all the links so that if you have stuff. And so if I do one thing a minute, we'll have 15 minutes to do all your questions. All right? Sounds all right. like a plan? Yeah. All right. So the first thing with any website launch, or even before you get started, is the preparation. So getting your things together, your thoughts about the goals of what you want the website to do before you even start to download or install WordPress, really important. So the first thing that I recommend having on that to-do list is actually having a checklist. How many of you have a checklist? Not enough. OK. <laughs> so about a quarter of the room has a checklist. I'm going to run through these things. It's really important to ensure quality with every site that goes out the door. The other thing that it's really good for is when you include the checklist in your proposal and you're meeting with your client, they can then use that to see, oh, look at all the things that I get with this particular website that's built versus the competition. So it's very helpful in that way. Drew, do you want the lights off for you? Are you guys able to see or do you want to turn the lights down? It would be better if the lights were dim. All right, I don't know if they've got the dimmer. Things up. One or a zero over there. Okay. So. Uh, easier. Can you still All right, see good. it? Yeah. Okay, it's better. All right. So think about in your checklist when you're launching the site, what do you want to have included on it? Do you share it with your clients? Do you share it with the rest of the team? And before the site is launched, do you have a pre site, pre launch checklist? And then once the site goes up, a second checklist. Because there are certain things you can't do until the site is live on the URL. Also, when you do this and you show all the things that are in the checklist, the client can see the things that are not and then ask about them. Because part of communication with clients is to make sure that uh, you don't want to get involved in that situation where they said, I thought this was included. Right? So the checklist helps with adhering to. These are the things that you're going to get as part of the deliverable to this project. And then everyone on the team is graded on whether they accomplished everything that's on the checklist. Tip two, admin users. Limit them. Everyone in the company doesn't need admin level access. If you're posting blogs to the site, not everyone needs the power and privileges of installing plugins or updating the theme. It also creates a security risk when you have every single user at a company or organization with admin level access. Also, make sure that everyone that's working on the website has their own username and password. And that username shouldn't be admin. Now we're gonna get into SEO, search engine optimization. So link structure. We know in SEO that the default way that WordPress handles permalinks is not the best for SEO. So if you're seeing question marks or equal signs in your permalink structure on the site, it's a no-no for SEO purposes. And you'll change that on settings in the permalink submenu. So a lot of these uh, tips will have a place for it to go. And so if you don't want to take notes, you know, if you get the slides afterwards, you can go see um, where those things are. The light blue bar on most of the panels will tell you where 
to fix those things. Tip four. This is my favorite. I got a call from someone who says my site's not showing up in Google because your web developer never unchecked a box. Uh, so you'll see in the search engine results the robots.txt file is blocking the site from being indexed. Um, don't launch sites with that box check. You can change that under settings in the reading tab. Third, install a plugin for SEO. <coughs> I'm in the and build link to which SEO plugin you install, but you should install at least one of them for your clients. Yoast or, or all-in-one SEO will do the job. Um, you can't rely on fun the default way that WordPress handles your title tags. Tip six, make sure those title tags and meta tags are unique for each page. So at the bottom level, you can have your title tags and meta tags just being what is on the content page. Then a step up from there would be to have default title tags and meta tags that are throughout the entire site. And the top level would be having unique ones for each page and title on the site. So these two sites will help you then index the site to see where you've duplicated those efforts. So if you want to move from tier two, which is where everything is the same, to tier three, where everything is unique, these tools will tell you which pages are duplicating. The other thing to check is when you're dealing with the blog categories, oftentimes most people will forget to put title tags and meta descriptions on the blog categories. So that's a good thing to do to help you get further indexing. But those two sites there will help you discover which pages are duplicated. Google Tag Manager. So how many of you are already familiar with what GTM is? Two. Good. Three. All right. So what I like in Google Tag Manager is to when you go into a hospital and the first time you come in, they give you the IV and the arm, right? That way the nurse or doctor doesn't have to come by and prick you every time they have to give you some medicine. What Google Tag Manager does is it installs this one injection point into your site, and from there you can install every other injection that you need, whether that be a remarketing code or Facebook tracking or Google Analytics. It's all done throughout that one point of contact. So rather than have multiple little snippets of code, you can have this one place and then regulate it. The other thing is you can turn it on and off so it doesn't create code load and cause the site to load. The third thing is you can see when it's firing and when it's not firing. When it's not firing, it's good to have some sort of message keyboard telling you that. So you can install that at google.com forward slash analytics forward slash tag dash manager. <coughs> Tip eight, install Google Analytics. There are some people that still don't install Google Analytics. You can't make any decisions about your website, not any educated decisions, without having Google Analytics installed. Unless you have empirical data of where people are coming into your site and where they're leaving, how long they're staying, what the entry points are, you can't really make any judgment calls on content. You can't make any judgment calls on SEO until you have the Google Analytics installed. The second piece in there is annotate. How many of you annotate your Google Analytics? Nobody. Good. So mm -hmm. annotation happens when you launch your website. You can go into Google Analytics and then tag, put a pin on the date you launch the website. So when you're looking at your Google Analytics over the course of time, you can see these pinpoints of each major event that happened in the history of your website. So that could be the date your site went live, that could be the date you hired a digital marketing company, that could be the date that you sent out an email newsletter to your list. So you can mark that. So next time when you're looking at these sort of bumps in your chart of traffic, you can then say, oh, that large bump in my traffic happened because I sent out an email newsletter. Or I hired Joe to start doing SEO for me. So that happened on October 5th, and now I can actually track the upward trajectory. So it's really nice to put those annotations in there. If you're installing Google Analytics for the client, put that uh, annotation in there. We launched the site on this day. Tip nine, Google Search Console. Previously called Google Webmaster Tools. So Google Webmaster Tools, uh, or Search Console, is sort of a dashboard, if you will, of 
how your website is performing. So from here, you'd be able to submit your XML sitemap of all the pages of your site. You, you'll be able to see how many pages of your site have been indexed. You can see the crawl rate. So let's say your site had 50 pages on it. From Search Console, you'll be able to see that only 25 of them have been indexed, or 30. From out of that, you can then diagnose, how do I get those other 20 pages indexed? More likely than not, especially with WordPress, it's because of a canonicalization issue. Canonicalization is what happens when you have duplicated content. So in WordPress, you have these archive pages that will display the blog posts, or they could display custom post types. That content is what's going to be the same as what's on the single post layer, the individual blog post itself. So if you have this archive page with all the content on it, and you also have the single page with the same content on it, even if it's just an abstract, it'll get flagged for a search console because they'll say, Google's whole motto is show me something I haven't seen already. Tell me something I don't know. So if it's seen that archive page, the same content on the single post in WordPress as it is in the archive page, it's highly likely that it won't be indexed. So that's where you'll see a discrepancy in your search console between, uh, on, especially in WordPress sites. The third thing that Search Console does that's really nice is let's say, heaven forbid, your open source software gets some sort of virus installed on it. Heaven forbid. Search Console, when Google gets notified that your site has malware on it, will then send you an email saying your site's been infected. That's kind of a nice thing that could happen. That was a bad word choice. Okay. <laughs> Tip 10, redirects. So you want to create 301 redirects for all the pages on the previous site to the new site. Because you've done all this work on your old site to get it ranking well, now you want to make sure that that page about doggy daycare redirects to its new counterpart. Because if the old counterpart was a .asp page, you're not going to be able to recreate that in WordPress. So now you have to create a 301 redirect so that that old content will then go to the new page. When you do that and set it up properly, there's no loss of link juice in that old page to the new page. When you don't create those 301 redirects, all that good value that you had in the search engine is then lost. Because it's going to a 404 page it could not be found. The second day after your site goes live, you can then go into Search Console, and there's a tab to see all your search errors. The biggest search error is going to be your 404 issues. So on day two, day three, day four, after the site goes live, you're going to be able to see all those pages that were previously indexed and are now creating 404 errors. This is highly important, especially if you like to go into WordPress and play around with your permalinks. So let's say you went to this SEO seminar and you then decided, oh, I need to change my permalinks to be Jacksonville Doggy Daycare, Jacksonville Dash Doggy Daycare, and the old page was just Doggy Daycare. So all those old pages could be creating 404 errors if you're not setting up the redirect properly. Page 11, or tip 11. This one's high level, but it's for the developers in the room to make sure that they're queuing their JavaScript and their CSS functions in the PHP file and not in, in the thing in itself. If that went over your head, that's okay. I got 29 others. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tip 12, test the load time. This is one of my favorite tools in the whole wide world. Tools.pingdom.com. You take your website, drop it in there, and it will tell you your overall load time. Now, the problem with this is it's going to give you a score. And as Americans, we live and die by the scores. We get a B and we think something's wrong with us. Don't worry about the letter grade that you get. Worry about the analysis of what you're seeing. If your site is loading and it's larger than three megabytes, and that's our internal barometer at my company, if it's larger than three megs, it's too heavy. So that usually means that your images or your videos that you have on your homepage, or whatever page you're testing, and I highly recommend testing more than just the homepage with this, but to test it to make sure it's under three megs.
As you go down to tools.pingdom.com, you're going to see all the resources on the page. Every single image, every single JavaScript file, every single file is going to be then listed there. Each resource that it's pulling off the server. It is possible, if you love you, love yourself some plugins, that you're going to see some red lines where resources couldn't be loaded. So if you're seeing a bunch of those on plugins you're not using anymore, that's a sign that you need to uninstall those plugins. Because each time you're pulling and pinging that other server for that, it's slowing down your load time of your own site. Tip 14. Matt Kersley has this great site. You can pop your website in there, and you can see how your website's going to look on pretty much every device for free. You don't have to go out and buy uh, any browser testing software. You don't have to buy browser stack or anything like that. If you're not an agency, you, know, you can go there and see where your breakpoints are for tablet, for smartphone, for desktop. So that way you can see how it's going to look on all different various devices. Tip 15. So Yoast or all-in-one SEO are going to give you an XML sitemap. That's a data file, file type, that you can then take into Search Console on Google Webmaster Tools or Search Console, drop it in there, and then it will then give the search engine all the pages <laughs> of your site. So they don't have to index the whole site because you're handing them essentially the, the table of contents of your website. The other one to do that everyone often forgets about is to do it to Bing's Webmaster Tools as well. It might only be 10% of search, but I think we would all like a raise by 10%. Remove the test links. If you're developing your site on WP Engine or Pressable or any one of these website uh, hosts, they're going to give you a test link. Bad developers leave the test links still there, just change the main URL of the site. This tool here at W3.org is going to allow you to test all the links on your site. And if you're seeing one of the old, let's say, Pagely links, you can then go back behind and then check to see which ones you have to remove. Sometimes some, just by changing the base URL in the settings, on you know, general settings, is not going to change all the file links for all the images on the site, especially if they were developing a custom site for you. So this will test that. Tip 17, AMP for accelerated mobile pages will help accelerate your mobile pages. Um, so, uh, really nice tool. Make sure your pages are super fast. The other thing that it's going to be really helpful with, it's going to get like really dark and rainy all of a sudden. The other thing it's going to be helpful for is uh, if you are in a place or if you are marketing to a population that doesn't have unlimited data plans, that AMP logo is a beacon for them. So they know that they can click on that link and it's not going to use all their data on their phone. In India, the AMP project is hugely important. If you're, if you're working towards either if you work for a nonprofit or an organization where they just don't have the, the luxury of having unlimited internet, this AMP uh, installation is really going to help you get faster at faster and faster load time. The one issue is it doesn't really fit in the WordPress ecosystem, but that's a whole different conversation. Curating the client experience. So this is some of the niceties that I like to add when we're launching sites. Video user manuals. There's something nice about handing your client a 90 page manual on how WordPress works. You print it out, you hand it to them, I even find it. It's out of date in six weeks as we know, but <laughs> you know, it, there's something super nice about it. Video user manuals also has about 80 different videos that you can show the client so when they forget how to add an image or they forget how to add a new page, 
they can rely on the video user manual for that. And it's updated with each new point of release. Tip 19, style your page not bound. Especially if it's a custom WordPress site that you're building on the theme. Put a little bit, this is often overlooked. People miss that 404 page very frequently. And it's a great way to sort of capture uh, and send them in the right direction. So giving them a search tool, saying here's your way back to home. Uh, here are some different options for people that have gotten here before. And you can find out all the people that are hitting your 404 page, where? Google Search Console is going to give you all your 404 errors. Mm -hmm. Style your pages consistently. So, one of the big separators between what is a custom, uh, between what is a professional website and what is an amateur site is style. So if you're using multiple fonts and colors that you wouldn't paint your house, those kind of things create sort of an amateur look. So you want to avoid that thing. So when you're creating these custom sites to limit the number of fonts in the CSS that are there. Remove the development plugins. So oftentimes when you're launched, when you're moving the site from the development server to the live server, and you're using plugins typically to move that plugin from you know, your development to production. Well, once the site's launched, that plugin's not needed anymore. But all too often, developers will leave that transfer plugin in there forever and a day. And it's just not needed anymore. And it's actually creating a vulnerability on that site now. So un to uninstall those development plugins uh, when you're going live, especially if the client's never going to use it again. Tip 22. This is my favorite one, and it happens all the time. So we'll go back to the doggy day here. The, design, the designer will get the project. They'll do wireframes. Info at jacksonvilledoggydaycare.com. They'll set it up. They'll figure it out. The wireframes will be done. The design will get done. The client loves it. It's approved. The developer gets it. They build it. The site goes up. Three weeks later, the client says, I'm not getting any leads or any inquiries from the website. And then you realize info in Jacksonville Doggy Day here never existed. <laughs> but you got so nose blind to it, it's like the Febreze commercial. No one noticed that that email address doesn't exist. All too often, you'll send it off and it'll immediately bounce back. So as part of web developers, just to send an email to it to say, hey, does this email even exist? Please reply back. Because oftentimes it will go to a box that no one is even checking. Test the forums. So again, same with the email. Use all the forms on the site to submit them. Those forms could be a contact form. The form could be the email newsletter form. It could be an e-commerce order form. All the forms on the site should be tested. The second piece is this, is to set yourself a reminder every month to test those forms. Because just because they worked, on February 1st does not mean they're going to work on March 1st. As we know, we're pushing out all these plugin updates all the time. It's very possible that that doesn't work. The second piece to this, after, well, the third piece after you do the calendar reminders, the third piece is know that your web host typically has unauthenticated, unauthenticated email. So you want to use some sort of SMTP delivery service like a Mandrill or a Sendrid to make sure that email is hopping off Pressable or WP Engine or PageLink and actually getting delivered to their inbox. So testing these forms is a key and crucial piece and it needs to be done monthly because you could be losing business by virtue of not receiving those emails. 2.4, success pages. How many of you have ever received an email, a form submission five, six, seven times? I have, and it's because they haven't, the person submitting the form didn't get that gratification that they filled in the form properly. The second piece of what the success form does is you can set up tracking your Google Analytics 
to fire an event when that page loads. So if you are running a digital marketing firm and you want to know how many leads you got over the course of the month or how many orders, you can set a tracking pixel on this page that will then create an event that you can use to monitor the number of leads you got without having to go through your email and say, oh, I got six leads this month. Check for gremlins and orphans. All too often we'll be copying content out of a source that we should that doesn't necessarily play well with WordPress. One of those sources is, is Microsoft Word. So all too often we'll add an ampersand or a quotation mark or a parenthesis of some sort and it will create a gremlin in the title text and meta text. Just to run through those on the site before the site goes live to make sure that none of those things happen. The other thing is the page breaks inside of Microsoft Word are typically different. So you'll see these orphans of lines that will drop and you just have to go through all the content to make sure that none of those line breaks carry through. Hello world. There's nothing that separates an amateur site from a professional one when you go to their blog and see the original Hello World post there. Yeah. If we're looking at a content, this, this needs to be removed. It's fine for your formatting, it's fine for your, your style sheet. But when the site goes up and seeing Hello World, it's not a professional business. Security. Those email addresses that we mentioned earlier should be obfuscated so that a bot or a spider can't index them. 28, this is presentation. Great backups. Most of the web hosts that you're going to be using are going to have, have their own backups. But if you're old school like me, I like to have another backup somewhere else. Trust but verify, right? I like to have one copy of the website in my own files. And when I build a website for someone, I will typically take the website and burn it to a jump drive and mail it to them. When they get that jump drive in the mail, they will put it next to their most sacred possessions. They will put it next to their tax return. <laughs> they will put it in a safe deposit box because it's something that they've done so much investing into their website and this is their critical backup. As we all know, you're updating the site all the time with new content and new posts. So those of us in the room know that it's going to be out of date, but at least it's a starting point to go back to in case there's something terrible that happens. <coughs> Tip 29. If you're not using a managed uh, web host, and even if you are, most of the managed web hosts only take care of core. So to have some sort of software that's taking care of the additional plugins that have been installed. We use uh, Manage WP and, and make sure that all the plugins are updated. <coughs> Can I ask a question? We got one more slide. Okay. <laughs> I forgot. I'm sorry. And tip 30, uh, to make sure that your site has an SSL certificate on it. Uh, there's a bunch of different vendors for this. Some of them are free. I've listed two of the free ones up there because I'm cheap. Um, but uh, those are some of the big options that are there. And come July, if you're using Chrome, it's going to say that that website is not secure. So if you, your website is not served, uh, served by HTTPS in, in July, um, everyone's going to see not secure on your site. So between now and then, if you don't already have one installed, to make sure that it's installed. All right, so if you weren't able to keep up with me, you can go to southernweb.com forward slash WPJAX and download these slides with all the links, but we can ask questions now, so by all means. With managed WordPress, when you're doing uh, plugin updates for clients, mm -hmm. how do you handle if it breaks? Who? Prayer. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can revert back, but right. at what point does it become the client's cost versus? Um, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> but if it breaks in our particular case, um, 
there's not a warranty that says that that plugin is good. And sometimes it's easy to just leave it as, let's say Yoast broke, and you had to replace with all in one. That, that's a fairly simple transfer, and it's not something that I'm too concerned about. But if some software just comes to its end of its life, and the client needs to update it, you know, you have to have a conversation with the client and explain that not only is it the end of life, it's probably going to become a security vulnerability at some point. And that's just really a conversation that the client, in our field case where we host all of our client sites, if they're not willing to reinvest, I have to move them off of my managed environment. So it's it's more like you, you've got to reinvest back into the site. To it. But on our side, I make sure that I have a developer doing all the, the updates so that if it does white screen, someone's there to get it back up. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I actually have several questions. So if I get in the way, you'll tell me to stop. Um, my first question is of all, all of these 30 things, how many of them are going to cost me money to do, and how many of them are free? Um, I don't think I put anything in that really oh, that's going to cost you money. Okay. I can't think, did anyone see any one that's going to? In SSL potentially, but there's a lot of free options for that too. Yeah. I, I specifically give this so that the things that are, that are free, the okay. only thing that isn't free is your time. Yeah. Because doing these 30 things is going to take you a week and a half. Right, if you do the wrong properly. Can I add to that real quick? I think it's really good hosting. <coughs> and with Google making the new release, that speed is so important. Yeah. You need to pay for the best hosting you can. Website room, is that good? Um, and there's some great people in here. Automatic has their hosting company in here. I don't want to say one over the other. I mean, we all have different preferences. So if you ask each one of us, we'll say something different. Right. Like, what we We'll probably debate it, but that's that's a cloth that you should put in every month to your site and not go cheap on that. Share it is bad. Yeah. It's like a condo that someone can break into. Sorry. Oh, you're good. That's that's a good analogy. Um you said at, um about deleting I love that you're flipping ones. pages. That was great. We just learned that. Can we turn on the lights again so we can yeah, yeah, see our on the screen? You said at one point that you have to go back and delete the old plugins. Ooh, wow. Um, and the remove the development plugins. Yeah. What? How? I, I know you just like figure out the old plugins because they pop up and on your management thing. But what do you consider development plugins that should be deleted before you? Turn oh, it over? if you if you had a developer that did a site transfer between like your old host and your new host, and you're not moving that site anymore. Okay. Moved it, you don't need to have it installed. There. So that's the only thing that would be something to delete. If you have deactivated plugins in there that are just hanging around for a rainy day, those don't need to be there. Okay. Velvet Blues. Okay, Velvet yeah. Blues is like a cover of your URL so you go live. That has to be one that should be yeah. okay. And a lot of people don't use Jetpack and um, a lot of the other ones that are. I mean, Jetpack is a big theme if your client isn't using it to remove it from. Off. There's, you know, it's a Swiss Army knife. You can take that thing off. Your site will run a little bit faster. I'll say that about Matt. So. Is he here? He was in Miami. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I have one other question. Yeah. Um, when you talked about the title and meta tags, um, I know what those are, but you sort of lost me when you started talking about the tiers one, two, and three. All right. So the first tier is the default way that WordPress handles it. Okay. It's just going to be the page title, whatever you put in the title field inside of WordPress. That's okay. that's one. Tier two is you install a plugin, and then it just copies everything over, and you put the same title tag and meta tag on every single page. It's kind of lazy, but at least it's checkbox, like you did it. Mm -hmm. Step up from there would be to do a little bit of research about what people are searching for, and okay. then come up with unique title tags and meta tags for each one of the pages of your site. Yes, sir. On site 30, you have the words force SSL. Yes. And when I have a SSL, but on SiteGround, if I go to my cPanel, I will see a little box that's, that's placed for a check, and it says force SSL. Mm -hmm. And then 
site ground gives you a warning that if you check that, bad things can happen. So I have an SSL, it's working, the box is not checked, and I'm afraid to check it because of the warning. So I don't really understand what it means when they say force SSL. I'm assuming. So you, you, my, I don't know fully, but the hint that you gave off was there I have an SSL, and it sounds like it's not their SSL. No, it's theirs. I, okay. It's working. I mean, okay. I, I get HTTPS, it's all good, green, green padlock, all good, I'm all right. fine. So you bought the SSL through someone else? No, it's less encrypted. It's, okay. through, it's through side ground. Okay. But the box says to force it. Mm -hmm. And the, my question really is about the word force. Because they implying or saying that that's going to do something beyond just having it. So I really don't know what forcing it means, I guess, is my real question. Yeah. I think he's talking about uh, forcing, uh, forcing the redirect. Yeah. Right. So it'd be forcing the non encrypted version to the secure version. The, the time when that might be an issue is, let's say you put a widget on the site that was unsecure, mm -hmm. and you're still serving it, and then it's throwing an error in some browser. So the widget would that, I think, is what the error, the, the warning is about inside of there, to make sure that all the content that you're serving is encrypted. And if you happen to be pulling like images from another website, that could cause a problem, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. When you have that third-party stuff, whether it be that weather widget or the images, or you iframe the site that was unsecure, no. that's probably what the warning is about. You, you yes. mentioned um, each of the developers has their own login. Do you pull all those logins before it goes on? Um, if you're not going to be involved in the site anymore. You know, if, that, if the site launch is the end of your relationship. See, so we would typically pull everything but one, and then we need to go back, only because uh, Half the time you have no idea is that employee still there or not still there. Right. Uh, I wasn't sure whether you felt it was good practice to pull when everything except what was necessary. Um, no, I, I would believe one. Yeah, I would believe one. Um, but if you've got multiple ones, and I would make sure that you get a list when you're working with the client of everyone who's going to be administrating the website and create. It's all too easy to get one username and then just hand it out yeah, yeah. and post it to a, the wall <laughs> or that notebook that so many people have in their office that has all the passwords. Or it goes on SharePoint. <laughs> so, so here's the I mean here's the kind of thing that and I like talking about this at, at WordCamp. Like if you're selling WordPress and they're of a Drupal school or a Joomla school, the first thing they're going to bring up is security. WordPress is not secure. And then you see the Brenda at the side desk over there has a notebook with all the passwords in it, right? <laughs> that she's had the same passwords there. So if you're looking at a community in terms of you know, making sure the sites are unhackable, yeah. having someone with a notepad in the corner creates a vulnerability in our community. So make sure that everyone, <laughs> Brenda with the notepad should not have admin access to the website, right? <laughs> <laughs> Your name isn't Brenda, is it? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm the one with the notebook. Do you have number 27? I wasn't, I didn't pull up there. All right, so if an email address, you know, Brenda at xyzcompany.com is sitting out there in normal mail to fashion, it's like a beacon to the bots and to the spiders to grab that and then start sending you Viagra spam. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like that. So, so you can just Google um, you know, encrypt email address, and it will give you the JavaScript that you can plop on the page and will hide your email address from those bots. Yes? Going back to the moving plugins, do you recommend moving? Can I deactivate or you recommend one removing it? I would I would I would remove them because you'll leave you know each deactivated plugin is still sitting out there, right? It's still sitting in the content folder. So the plugins folder. So if you can remove that vulnerability, especially if you're done, right? If you're done done and it's been two or three days, 
in it. You're not going to have to push a new release up there. What about templates? If you start, very often if you start a new website, it comes with like five different templates uh -huh. and in the background. And I heard you should leave at least once because if the one you build breaks, at least you have something else to show it on. Yeah, that would be a sad website. But yeah. <laughs> I, I would rather see you have backups in place yeah. for the website than trying to rely on the theme that isn't the proper theme. Okay. Right? I'd rather see, oh, I can do a one click backup than let me find the theme and kind of wing it for a little bit. So I'd rather bring back the site that wasn't corrupted. Okay. <laughs> yes? Um, as, as, a, as an client, um, how does this checklist going to help me? Do I just hand it to my developer and say, so before they get started, yeah, you could do that. Um, I mean, essentially you're giving them a work order with this, of what needs to be done. Most of these things, with the exception of the encrypting, the, the CSS or the JS, most of the things in here you can do. Right? The email addresses you can encrypt. You know, it's just in the content block and WordPress. WordPress. You can click the force SSL button on the website, right? Most of the most everything in this list is designed so you can do it. I'm not trying to create a, this is not the developer track. I'm not creating a version controlled environment where you've got to learn pre processing scripts. No, that's not what this checklist is about. So, sorry, um, so if you go through um, a lot of these, are already going to be there, you just click and unclick? Or yeah. Then, okay. Once you get into WordPress, most of the things are going to be here. I think there's maybe three things you won't be able to do. You know, I'm thinking back. I mean, the, the CSS editing, and I think that's about it. I can think of it off the top of my head. <coughs> Most of the stuff you'll be able to take advantage of yourself and for free. Yes? Uh, with the 301 redirects, I'm launching a project this weekend. Mm -hmm. So I've got an old domain, I'm putting on a new domain. How do I redirect? specific pages of the old domain. Because I know I can do the top level domain to the new domain, mm -hmm. but how would I redirect those old pages? So everything on you're changing everything on the end date from old to the new. Yeah. <clears throat> then you would do the whole thing. So yeah. I can only do the top level domain. Why would you not want to? I mean well I want to get those specific pages like the dollar contact the does that make sense? But you the you page probably, are you probably to add, yeah, the page the <coughs> the developer had it set up where it had the .php is like if the whole thing is changing, you're yeah. get a whole new name, you can just set it to the page URL okay. and everything. <coughs> but you to, unless the page is set as five pages, if you get a whole bunch more than five pages, yeah. then but I think you get to do the base URL. Okay. So that's <coughs> Yeah. This is more if you had a site launch where you're moving from. <coughs> one page structure to a different one. But if you're moving the whole enterprise from one domain to a different one, I can do it in the base. So there is a setting in Goodwin <coughs> uh, for your current URL. Uh, yeah. And you can check it and tell uh, Google to just like read index the whole thing. Okay. That it's a, it's a revamp, basically, of yeah, yeah, your site. That. And that's, and well, that's new. Yeah. Okay. There's a new feature for that. Thank you, I forgot. I think we're done on time. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Thank you. <coughs> well, two minutes. Everybody. Thank you.